Were you invited to Barack Obama's 60th birthday party? <laughs> I wasn't. So that's what it's all about. You weren't? <laughs> yeah. yeah, clearly. Yeah. It was a great time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, no, what, I, what? I I really wanted to um, you know um, party with Vernon Jordan and all those guys, and that I was mad. Yeah, so yeah, it was great. You know, the guy from Migos was there. Dwayne Wade was there. It was cool. yeah. uh, why why are you so mad at Obama? What why what what prompted you to write the 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 piece calling him one of the worst ex presidents ever? <laughs> yeah, besides the fact that I wasn't invited. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, so um, well. Uh, um, I've been getting madder and madder um, at um, Obama um, as as he, you know, gets into his ex presidency. I mean, you know, obviously um, we we shouldn't expect too much of ex presidents. They, after all, were um, you know they're retired from being the CEO of the world bourgeoisie. Like, of course, they're going to be terrible people for the most part. Um, you know, but. Um, but I, I do think that they have a certain, um, that there is a certain moral authority that they have um, in our society and they have a, whether earned or unearned, and they have, um, um, and they generally have recognized that to some extent and felt obligated to do some things in the public interest. You know, they, um, they often get involved in, um, in large scale charity, um, you know, they, um, I mean, obviously, the best example of an ex-president is Jimmy Carter, who, you know, has spent his time building houses for the homeless and even defending democracy in Venezuela against the United States, which is kind of a rare uh, yeah. thing. Um, you know, so, you know, so with Jimmy Carter being the, the best example, but um, but ex-presidents in, in, in general, um, you know, they either sort of um, lead a, a quiet, dignified life largely out of sight or they, you know, will occasionally get involved in, in big humanitarian things. And, you know, we sort of accept that that's their role. Um, the the Clint, Clintons um, really started to um, take that in another direction with their own um, use of the, uh, of the sort of ex-president brand to amass enormous amounts of wealth. Um, and... Um, and you know, once you know, um, like once once people do that, they're really um, placing themselves in um, the you know in the company of um, the most antisocial, parasitical people on earth. And, you know, so they're going to become worse <laughs> people, right? I mean, they're just like they're that's who they're hanging out with all day. Um, so. Um, but still, Epstein. the Clintons, did, yeah, yeah, Epstein, all all those people. But still, you know, the 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 Clintons sort of maintain, have maintained this facade of you know, they're like they they do, um, you know, they do humanitarian things. Um, they did attempt to defeat Trump in the election. They were very involved in that, if we recall. I mean, like the, it's not as though they have completely. Um, um, drifted out of, um, of of the public of, of any attention to the public interest. Um, um, Obama has really um, gone in the Clintonian direction and then some, um, and um, and you know some. Um, so so what what set me off was this ridiculous party. Um, it, you know, so he's like he's having um, he he was just having this. Um, massive party that um, that was um, you know as uh, you know as the CDC and the White House were really clearly struggling with what kind of messages to give Americans about the Delta variant and what is safe and what is unsafe. Um, you know um, the Obamas were just clearly like we don't give a shit about that and we're just going <laughs> to have this massive party on Martha's Vineyard. Um, and, um, and it was clear that they then had to be talked um, out of it, but talking, being talked out of it meant that they just, they had like 400 celebrities instead of the even bigger party that they had planned. Um, so, um, so, so, you know, so, so that was sort of a mild, bit of contempt for the um, for the public interest but um we've seen um much more um serious examples um the um the museum that he's currently 
um, building in Chicago um, um, drastically infringes on a public park. The community has been protest around it has been protesting it for years. <laughs> Um, there have there are many different kinds of plants and bird species in the park that will be uh, very negatively impacted by um, this um, this um, super ugly structure that he's um, erecting um, um, in uh, like a public park um, that will cut off all kinds of light sources to the park and also look awful because it's a it's a quite um, beautiful old like well designed park, you know. So it's just really I mean, and the and the community has been protesting it for years, and um and I wrote about <laughs> it at the end of last year. Um, and what was one one thing that was particularly um, um, a particularly disturbing irony um, um, was that um, um, it was actually a ruling by Amy Coney Barrett, um, his job, that allowed him to go ahead with the library. Um, and in her ruling, she argued that the community activists didn't have standing um, to um, protest um, the park because it didn't hurt them as individuals. It was just the argument yeah. that they were making was on behalf of the, like this will affect yeah. our community negatively. And if you think about that, that is a profoundly reactionary argument. Um, <laughs> I mean, like that's like really that really takes um, I mean, so 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 Obama is basically depending on this very reactionary bit of legal reasoning, which is a very dangerous precedent. Um, to build his library, like he's he is his library rests on um, a legal foundation of total un, um, annihilation of the idea <laughs> of the public interest. So, well, yeah, Bessner's very I mean, Bessner's very mad that also our friend Eddie Bessner is very mad that the the Obama Library won't have a research center and it won't be overseen by the federal research association there's like some federal agency that that oversees all the presidential libraries and obama's will be run by a private foundation and won't yes. have any of his presidential records or anything like that available for historians to yeah. um study his presidency year, in years to come like like with all other wow. presidents even the bad ones have yes you know like nixon has that. a presidential library and yeah. a research thing where you can look through his things obama yeah, won't have that the that's very Ford angry library. about that it's a, like, yeah, it's exactly. a real library it has archives and archivists you know yeah, wow. yeah, totally. Yeah, no, that's right. I should have talked about that in this column too, because it really is that really is also um, totally obscene. Well, I mean, to be fair to you, there there are there's so, so many, there's so many, there's so many things to choose from. Yeah, yeah there's totally. so many. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think um, some of the other examples you highlight are important to mention. Um, especially his involvement in uh, the NBA strike. So, oh, can you yeah. talk about that? Yeah, so um, I mean, if if people recall um, last summer, um, you know, with um, all the protests around the killing of black men like Jacob Blake and George Floyd, um, the um, the um, a lot of um, a lot of athletes were asking themselves, you know, what can we do? What can we do to amplify these um, these protests and um, stand with our communities? Um, you know, and um, um, and the um, and the NBA players um, were um, um, walked out and were cons and were contemplating a longer strike, and um, Obama um, got involved. Um, talked to <laughs> LeBron James, talked to the um, head of the players' union, and told them to get back on the court. You know, and um, it's amazing. It's just amazing, you know. And this was sort of the um, one of the biggest moments of um, you know people in the street um, protesting against racism, and um, you know Obama was um, supposed to be at the very least kind of a um, a, a, a tribune against racism. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. um, you know, and. Uh, but but the fact that, but I think that that it was such um, that it was a mass protest and that it was a labor protest, um, all of that was like, you know, 
I mean, he knows his job as a member of the ruling class is to um, shut that down. And he did. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it was actually really similar um, to his role in the Democratic primary yeah. Yeah. of organizing. I mean, he, um, you know, the um, we, um, you know, the some, some when the ruling class organizes, they sometimes organize really effectively. And this was an example. I mean, he organized um, the um, um, the centrist candidates to drop out and get behind Biden. Um, and it was really kind of an emergency for them to stop Bernie. Um, and then um, on top of that, you know, really, um, you know, um, talk to and put pressure on Bernie to drop out. That part isn't the more significant part. The more significant part was really organizing the centrists. Yeah. Um, but, um, but you know, the, the, the net effect was, you know, most of the time he's like lounging on Richard Branson's yacht, but, you know, when does he get involved, <laughs> you know, to, um, you know, in something affecting the public, you know, to defeat Bernie Sanders, like the, you know, the, the, the first, um, you know, possibility in a long time for um, the masses of the American public um, to uh, be represented in government. So. Priorities, it's, it's funny, you know? Yeah, it shows it shows the power of ideology because it was also reported in the early days of the primary that Obama was pressuring an art of pressure suggesting to Joe Biden that he shouldn't run because he yes. he knew that Joe is like this old guy who's kind of losing it at this point. Um, yeah. And he was like, listen, Joe, you don't have to do this. But like, despite his own res personal reservations about Joe's capacity to be president, you know, once uh, once the, you know, the the rubber hit the road, he was like, no, we need to stop. <laughs> we need to do it. Yeah. We need to stop Bernie. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's and, right. And it is, is interesting yeah. given um. I, I think actually um, he and some other Democrats did, I think, a little bit underestimated Biden's electability. I yeah. mean, that's really not was not never the problem. Because they Biden. knew him personally. Yeah, you know? I know. They're like, this yeah. guy? I know, this but guy? Like, most people don't know him personally. You know? Exactly. So, like, yeah, yeah. People, people were basically fine with him. You know? um, <laughs> you know, so, um, but but I think... Um, I, I think they, I think they kind of underestimated Biden's electability in that way. But it is telling that, given his, you're right, Nando, that um, given his um, all ex, his well documented reservations about Biden's electability, that he was he still was very clear that it would be better to have Biden um, as the nominee than Bernie Sanders. Yeah. You know, final question for me, because I mean, anyone paying attention can see how devastating some of uh, the Obama era policies were, especially, you know, post 2008 and the response to it. It only uh, further exacerbated inequality. And then you see his activity and behavior, you know, outside of the White House, post presidency. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I certainly do not have favorable feelings toward him, but you look at polling and the majority of the democratic electorate has just a massively favorable opinion of totally. him. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. He's very popular. Um, yeah. yeah. And I should say, um, um, you know, we were talking about Cuomo earlier and, um, you know, I, I think uh, on, um, um, in a, in, at Jacobin, you know, in our writings and in our broadcasts, we are usually, um, on the side of the masses and the mass public, but um, you know, Cuomo's really very popular too. If, yeah. if there had been an election, he would have probably won. You know, I mean, you know, unless there was a really um, viable, um, you know, challenger. But it, it's very. Uh, it, I think that um, um, uh, you know, and and I th and Obama is very popular. Also, I think part of the reason for that is that um, um, Republicans are just so awful, you know, that, I mean, that, you know, people sort of elevate these, these liberal figures as, um, as the, the best alternative, um, you know, and, um, and, and I think that in, in Obama's case, it's, um, it's also slightly understandable because of the level of irrational hatred that he inspired from the right, much of which was very racist, um, and all of which was completely deranged. I mean, just in terms of like, he's a so the idea that he was a socialist and, you know, all those things. Um, but I, I think, um, 
you know, there's a, a, a there there's a sort of um, a way in which that kind of vilification from the right can lead to um, you know a more, um, more you know more love from the left, especially the center left. Um, in terms of in in Cuomo's case, it's I think far less excusable because um, the Republicans in New York are not even a major force. So um, you know yeah. if you're you know if you were like if you were wearing a Cuomo sexual t shirt last year, <laughs> you you were just really not paying very much attention to either what Cuomo was doing or to the many organized alternatives to him. You know. Well, I, 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 on in that vein, I have to, I, I cannot resist. I have to ask the two ladies on the show <laughs> because I understand Obama's sexual appeal. I, as a man, I mm -hmm. understand it. He's a cool, handsome dude, um, charming, funny, uh, all that stuff. The Cuomo sexual thing, like, I, I know that you guys are not on board, but like, is there a place where you can put yourselves in that mindset to? to explain it in some way because it strikes me as like this utterly bizarre thing that was happening and i remember talking to 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 some women in my life at, when when it was at the height of it and i'm like i was like what do you what is what do you guys see in this guy like what is going what was going on there why the why the sort of sexual appeal of andrew cuomo this like disgusting man very obviously disgusting very man. obviously disgusting man <laughs> yeah. yeah what's going on there um, yeah, I, I have a few thoughts on it. You, you have any? Uh... Yeah, I'll be, I'll be brief. I mean, I, I don't know if it was so much about his sexual appeal. I just think that when yeah. Cuomo sexual yeah. became a thing, it was more about, look, the country was terrified. I mean, yeah. we were dealing with the beginning stages of the pandemic and we also unfortunately had a lack of leadership in the federal government and, it was very easy to juxtapose Trump's disastrous coronavirus press briefings with that of Cuomo's, which if you just isolate Cuomo's press briefings, they weren't really a big deal. He was just reading things off a screen. And, and but he sounded competent and people were looking for safety and comfort. Yes. So I think that's where it came from, honestly. But that's I, like a sexual thing. I, I, I just like, that's right. I, don't, I get that, but like yeah. now I want to have sex with him, you know? <laughs> I, I, I think so. I think that that, I, I think, I think that was completely it on it. And that, um, um, Trump was so, um, completely in denial that there even was a virus. Um, and you know, then, um, and then completely, you know, digging into the most irrational possible, um, reactions, um, encouraging the most um, ignorant and reactionary elements of our society to kind of mobilize. I mean, it was terrible. Like, I mean, if you if yep. you think back on it, um, and uh, um, and and I think that uh, you know, in contrast, Cuomo seemed kind of statesmanlike in a way that. Um, you know, we now know he was letting then people die in nursing homes and he was covering it up. And um, and we did know at the time that he was presiding over hospital closures even after the um, pandemic began. Um, so um, so the, the, the Cuomo sexual, um, you know, ador wave of adoration was never exactly rational. But on the other hand, just hearing a public official acknowledge that this was really happening and explaining what they were trying to do about it. Um, I think um, fed such a deep desire by the public for some kind of leadership that, um, yeah, I mean, I think people did experience that as a kind of um, arrows and, you know, that's sad, <laughs> but yeah. that's oh, totally. kind of where we were at. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Liza Featherstone, uh, you've been wonderful. Thank you for taking the time to have this conversation with us. Everyone, go to Jacobin immediately. Check out her yeah. uh, two pieces, Elite Feminist Ran Cover for Andrew Cuomo, and Barack Obama has been one of the worst ex-presidents ever. <laughs> Lisa, thank you again. Thank you Liza. so much, both of you. Thank you. If you enjoyed this clip from Jacobin Weekends, please hit like and subscribe. You can also watch the full episode or catch any future live stream by clicking the join button below and becoming a Jacobin YouTube member. Thank you.